Good evening and welcome back to the Sohn Lecture Series. I'm Michael Diaz Griffith, Executive Director of the Sohn Foundation, and we are so glad you could join us. We've actually been very heartened by the participation levels we've seen in the last few lectures. In February, there were uh, participants from 14 countries, and we just could not be more grateful for your participation, for your engagement, for your questions. To that end, please feel free to enter questions into the Q&A box on your screen throughout tonight's session. Um, our wonderful speaker will get to those questions at the end of her talk when we return for a little chat. Um, if you've joined us before, you know that we have, we always have a, a rather lively Q&A. And she will appear on the screen throughout the presentation. So depending on your device, um, if the box that the presenter appears in is covering the presentation in any way, you may need to move it to the side, uh, whatever works for you so that you can enjoy the presentation. With that, I will pass things over to Paul Whalen, uh, our chairman who will introduce tonight's speaker. Paul. Thank you very much, Michael. And welcome everybody on this beautiful spring evening, at least if you're here in New York. Uh, I wanna start by thanking the trustees of the Sir John Sounds Museum Foundation and especially our program committee led by Jonathan Hogg. This season's lectures have taken us all over the world following themes of color and light, the very essence of Sir John Sohn's masterwork at the museum. Tonight, we bring you back home to the museum where Helen Dory will give us a look at the ways that John Sohn achieved his spectacular effects. Helen Dory, by the way, is, is the most wonderful person. You must meet her sometime. And she has been deputy director of Sir John Sohn's museum since 1995. For 30 years, she has worked on the authentic restoration of the museum, culminating with the opening of Soane's private apartments in 2015. Her publications include John Soane and J.M.W. Turner in catalogs of Soane's furniture and stained glass. She has curated ex exhibitions at the Soane, Tate Britain, and the Royal Academy. Her current projects include the forthcoming restoration of Soane's drawing office, which we're financially supporting here at the foundation, by the way. Uh, she is also chairman of the scholarship committee of Addingham Trust, a trustee of the Mauger, Mauger Hanger House Preservation Trust, and a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Uh, Helen, welcome, and we're so thrilled that you could be with us here tonight. Thank you so much, Paul. And um, it really is a, a delight to join you and your fellow directors and members of the foundation and lots of others. I know that lots of my friends on both sides of the United States are listening in. Um, I wish I could just see you all. And I think we even have some loyal trustees of Sir John Soane's Museum who are staying up late to, uh, to participate. Well, without... Um, Further ado, I think um, once I get control of the screen, um, I can start. Michael, I'm not seeing the button allowing me to take control mm -hmm. at the moment. You should see it now. If you press down on your cursor, I think you'll be able to begin. Okay. No. I'm still getting the message that I'm viewing your screen, but not that I've got control. There we are, perfect. Thank you, Michael. That seems to be working now. Um, when Sir John Soane died at Lincoln's Inn Fields on the 10th of January, 1837, amongst its many treasures, his house and museum incorporated 15 windows, five doors, two skylights and one glazed screen containing subject panels of ancient stained glass set into coloured glass borders. Another 11 doors and windows and 10 skylights contain coloured glass. Most of those combined light or dark yellow glass or etched white glass 
with um, decorative borders. Right, try and get this to move on. There you go. There Thank we you. are, brilliant. Sorry, that's the correct second one. Uh, I'll just go back. Most of these combine light or dark yellow glass or etched white glass with decorative borders created by Soane's glazier, William Watson. And the borders might be either a fret, as you can see here on the right, Greek key, ball enrichment, um, you can see that center left, or scroll enrichment, which you can see bottom left. Um, one rather intriguing type of glass that Soane used was what he called diaper or embossed glass. And you can see that center top and on the extreme right of this slide, um, the pattern is hand etched into the ground color. All this glass was combined with a varied program of paint colors from Imperial Porphyry in the front entrance hall to Pompeian red in the library dining room, olive green in the picture room and Turner's patent yellow with bronze green detailing in the drawing rooms. All these colors combined with marbling and graining of different kinds for doors and skirtings. The main staircase was fully marbled in imitation of Jello Antico. Only the attic rooms and the kitchens, the province of the servants, had no colored glass and mostly plain stone colored walls with whitewashed ceilings. Soane's interest in colored and stained glass stemmed from his obsession with light and the effects that it could create as part of an architectural setting, rather than from an antiquarian interest in collecting ancient glass panels. His refusal to allow visitors to his museum in wet or dirty weather testifies to his belief that lighting effects were integral to his architecture. This interest originated in his earliest architectural training and developed further during his intensive study of architectural theory in preparation for his Royal Academy lectures. Soane was well aware of the architect Sir William Chambers description of how in an architect's method of lighting any building, quote, the quantity of light introduced should be regulated so as to excite gay, cheerful, solemn or gloomy sensations in the mind of the spectator according to the nature and purposes for which the structure is intended. The idea of architecture creating different moods was developed by the French theorist Le Camus de Mezier, who emphasized the key role played by light, which could make buildings mysterieux or triste, mysterious or sad. Soane translated a whole passage from Le Camus when preparing his lectures as follows, quote, a well-lighted and well-aired building becomes agreeable and cheerful. Less open, less sheltered, it offers a serious character. The light still more intercepted, it is mysterious or gloomy." End quote. And in his eighth Royal Academy lecture, Soane spoke vigorously in support of what he called the Lumière Mysterieuse, so successfully practiced by the French artist. He continued that this was, quote, a most powerful agent in the hands of a man of genius, um, but that it was one not used enough in England because we do not sufficiently feel the importance of character in our buildings to which the mode of admitting light contributes in no small degree. Soane was surely influenced by Le Camus' description of a house as a theater in which every room evoked different and appropriate sensations with light and illusion used to create mood. The desire to create, uh, the desire to use color and light to evoke mood is seen in Soane's earliest designs for Lincoln's Inn Fields. And here is a design for his museum from the summer of 1808, just when he was beginning um, planning and construction of what later became the dome area. And you can see the strong contrast between a well-lit sunny upper area and the gloomy crypt beneath, where the dark color and bluish light gives the appearance of a dank catacomb. Um, strips of colored glass are used in the skylight. Much later, Soane's friend, the lady novelist, Barbara Hoffland, described the same contrast as she wrote of looking down from the lobby to the breakfast room through an aperture in the floor into the basement. She wrote, Looking downwards, 
we behold the catacombs, pale and shadowy in their solitary crypt. Looking upwards, the beams of golden light fall on lovely specimens of art. Soane's interest in the use of coloured and stained glass to create moods was in part inspired by the English picturesque movement and the example of two earlier collectors, William Beckford at Font Hill and Horace Walpole at Strawberry Hill, both of whom had made extensive use of stained glass in their interiors. Soane was commissioned, in fact, to design a picture gallery for Alderman Beckford at Font Hill Splendens in the 1780s, this is not it, and certainly knew the later atmospheric interiors of the younger William Beckford's Font Hill Abbey, designed by James Wyatt. And here you see two details of stained glass at um, Font Hill Abbey. In Soane's library is a copy of the 1812 published description of that extraordinary abbey, which includes many references to the stained glass windows. For example, Beckford's parlour had um, painted glass um, in it within um, compartments of delicate medieval tracery. The South Oriel window of his long gallery contained, quote, stained glass representing the forefathers of the church, while another bay window contained figures of St. Columba, St. Ethelreda, the Venerable Bede and Roger Bacon in stained glass, all painted by the Georgian glass painter Francis Edgington. Elsewhere, Beckford had more glass by Edgington, um, copied from drawings of um, an artist called Richard Hamilton and representing, quote, a series of some of the most historical personages among Mr. Beckford's ancestors. Thank goodness Sir John Soane never went so far as to commission, commission panels depicting his so-called ancestors, but Font Hill Abbey was nevertheless clearly an influence. Strawberry Hill was rather closer at hand for Soane, being located near the River Thames at Twickenham on the outskirts of London. And here you see the recently recreated windows at Strawberry Hill, the Star Chamber on the left and the Holbein Chamber on the right. Although Soane's name doesn't appear in Walpole's letters or on the lists of named visitors to Strawberry Hill, he did own a copy of the 1774 description of the house and he collaborated on several occasions with the antiquarian John Carter, who made drawings of the interiors at Strawberry Hill. The Font Hill and Strawberry Hill descriptions must have inspired Soane to work with John Britton, um, an antiquary and close friend, on the earliest published account of his museum of 1827, written by John Britton and titled The Union of Architecture, Sculpture and Painting. And the Walpole and Beckford descriptions certainly inspired Soane to publish his own descriptions of his residence in 1830, 1832 and 1835. These publications take us to the heart of Soane's use of stained and coloured glass in the museum. The text of Britain's Union is a bit dry, but he devotes a great deal of attention to Soane's lighting effects. Um, it's interesting that he claims that little advantage has previously been taken by modern architects of stained glass and says that Soane should be thanked for removing prejudice against its use and showing, um, quote, by his successful adaptation of this truly valuable accessory, end quote, how it could be applied to create picturesque effects. Soane's own 1835 description is a good starting point for a picturesque walk through the museum as it looked at the end of his life to see how he used his stained glass. Not only do we have his own words, but those of his old friend, Mrs. Barbara Hoffland, the lady poet I mentioned earlier. Her interpolations into Soane's text are gushing, but nevertheless, they give a vivid insight into the picturesque sentiment that Soane was trying to evoke. And what I think is even more interesting is that Soane chose to include them in his publication and that they, to some extent, must express what he told her. Um, in the introduction to his, his description, Soane explains that he's written it to be a useful guide and to give an idea of how the works of art are arranged and the different effects produced and to show the close connection between painting, sculpture and architecture, music, and poetry. The works of art, he adds, have been arranged as, quote, studies for my own mind. 
He also notes that his description is written for the advantage of the architect rather than for the antiquary or any other kind of visitor. As soon as the text begins and we enter Soane's front entrance hall, seen here, we see where Soane's interest in his antique and coloured glass lies. He says, quote, the door of communication between the recess and the staircase is decorated with scriptural subjects on glass and produces an agreeable effect, it's particularly when the door into the hall is open. Mrs. Hofflin praises the vista-like character of this entrance, saying it is extremely pleasing, whether seen as a whole, illuminated by various colored lights or examined in parts. And she notes that each of the parts of this area have the same advantage, quote, since the light from the door, the light from the painted glass and the lights which descend from the staircase and also come in from the breakfast parlor, aided by reflections from mirrors, all tend to produce, quote, those richly tinted lights so highly admired in our finest cathedrals. No details are given of the subjects of the glass panels in the fanlight or in the inner door. And these views, one from 1835 and the same view today, um, look towards the inner hall door, which the text um, explains is out of sight. You just can't see it. But um, here you do see it. Uh, we put it back in 2016 with its original glass. Um, on the left, you see it combined with the walls of the outer hall, decorated in imitation of porphyry and rusticated on the lower part. Porphyry had a particular Roman imperial connotation. The porphyry finish in the hall dates from 1840, and it's one of the oldest surviving surfaces in the museum. As you move towards the inner hall door, walking from the front door, um, the colour modulation alters. You can see that as you get closer to that door, the recess just before you reach it is marbled in imitation of Giallo Antico, a much lighter colour rather than the porphyry continuing all the way to the door. On the right, you see that inner door from the other side, from the staircase hall, and that continues the lighter marbling with light pouring down from above um, through the large skylight at the top of the main staircase. And that, of course, helps to illuminate the glass. Moving on into the dining room and library, you enter a space that's decorated in Pompeian red, combined with mouldings picked out in bronze green. Not only the colour, but the design resembles Roman architecture as depicted in frescoes of the first century AD. And on the right of this slide, I've just popped in an image of an engraving um, of one of the frescoes excavated in the grounds of the Villa Negroni in Rome, while Soane was actually there in the late 1770s. And you can clearly see the relationship between the two. To continue with Soane's description, in the library dining room, he notes, quote, the window in the north end of this room is enriched with scriptural subjects on glass, among which are the creation of the world and the day of judgment. These works are very ancient and in excellent preservation. The panels he refers to are these two, the ones um, either side of the arrangement in the lower part of the window, and they are said to be Swiss um, and to date from around 1600. Soane was obviously conscious of their antiquity only twice in the entire description um, are the subjects of stained glass panels given. And this is one of them. A small digression, um, these panes were badly damaged in World War II and put into store. That fact was forgotten. And when I joined the museum in the late 1980s, everyone thought these panels had been destroyed. And I remember vividly looking at old black and white images and thinking what an awful loss this was. And I, I had one of the greatest moments of my life as a curator, the thrill of actually finding them in a car store which resembled a terrible black hole. And I was working with a colleague, we pulled out a flat packing case which hadn't been taken out since, since 1955. It was full of straw. And I remember opening it, pulling out all the straw and seeing these panels and that feeling of absolute astonishment. And, and I was completely overwhelmed. And um, I made it my mission at that moment to get them back on display. And um, we did put them back in the early 90s. 
Between them in the window are three um, further panels set into elaborate and, and uh, complex borders of what's sewn called architectural ornament with the embossed glass that I mentioned earlier. And these are probably the most formal and elaborate panels anywhere in the museum. Despite this formality, Sohn uh, still used this arrangement to create a picturesque effect, inserting pieces of mirror glass in the pier table at the other end of the room to ensure reflection of the stained glass, as well as the cordial vase, which stands in front of it. I've put a reminder of that um, top left. And the uh, mirror glass in that pier table, which you can see in the distance between the windows, um, bottom left, and in more detail to the right, um, that has three mirrors in it. Um, you can see the carpet reflection in the image on the right. In the center of that uh, desk or pier table is a piece of mirror that's canted back at an angle um, to reflect the glass and the vase. And the effect was probably intended maybe even to be humorous as guests seated at Soane's dinner table turned and saw the cordor vase apparently sitting on the floor at the other end of the room. Following the route of Soane's 1835 description, we would next enter his little study, his private workroom filled with Roman fragments which had belonged to his early teacher, the architect Henry Holland. This was a working space, so the light needed to be good. No glass is mentioned here by Soane, but the study was lit from above through a coloured glass skylight, which you can see in the watercolour here from 1822, and that um, had alternating pale and amber coloured um, strips of glass. And we know that the window contained um, three tiny uh, medieval quarries, which were um, hung from one of the glazing bars. They're in the original inventories from 1837, and you can see them on the right. Sadly, they're not yet back in situ, but I hope they will be one day. Like the library dining room, this small study is decorated in a Pompeian red, appropriate for the first century Roman fragments hung there. The dressing room next door, on the left in this slide, had a slightly different atmosphere, um, because the views out of, the, out of its windows presented views that combined the classical and the Gothic. From one window, the one to the left, um, Sohn could enjoy a view of his monument court um, with a column of architectural fragments known as the pasticcio in the center. Out of the other window to the right, he could see a view of the medieval ruins in the monk's yard. The watercolor shows three pieces of stained glass hanging in that right-hand window, oddly enough, not incorporated within it, which is rather unusual. That window contained dark and, and light yellow colored glass, as you can see in the picturesque view on the right, which looks up towards it from the ruins in the monk's yard. As the dressing room had windows in both west and east walls, it seems very likely that Sohn intended the rising sun to create some wonderful intense effects through this yellow glass. Sadly, those effects are blocked off today by modern buildings if they were ever present. Um, perhaps one day a scientist will come along and tell us if they would ever have worked. In the ceiling of the dressing room is a model um, of the lantern light that Soane designed for Freemasons Hall. You can see it on the left, it looks rather tiny, um, and on the right, an, another engraving to help you locate it in the ceiling. The model incorporates painted glass decorated with astrological signs and rosettes. Um, Sohn became a Freemason in 1813 um, and virtually immediately, I mean, within a few days, was made Grand Superintendent of Works. And he designed the new Freemasons Hall in Great Queen Street, built in 1828, in a synthesis of classical and Gothic style. Um, oddly enough, appropriate for this dressing room. Uh, by the time he designed Freemasons Hall, coloured light was central to his understanding of architectural effects. And um, the new hall, and this is a drawing from the V&A of, of the lantern of the hall, um, had four side windows of coloured and patterned glass, um, including a yellow diaper pattern on an orange ground. 
and the painted glass in the four clear story windows contained representations of five columns, a Masonic reference to the five orders of antiquity, which you can see at the bottom of this drawing. And the central lantern above featured the signs of the zodiac in yellow ground glass, alternating with rosettes. And all this glass is reduced in miniature in that tiny model you saw in the ceiling. And I just put in for fun, um, this view of the Freemasons Hall by night, which hangs in the picture room. It's drawn by Joseph Michael Gandhi, and it shows a sort of eerie interior with colored light pouring in through the lantern above the suspended canopy. Um, that sort of resembles something a bit like a sarcophagus lid, um, created, creating what the late Professor David Watkin called a daring and sublime Gothic aesthetic effect. Returning to the museum, beyond Soane's dressing room, the visitor enters the museum itself, running across the whole width of the back of the house and lit by a series of skylights, most filled with pale or dark yellow glass. And these views give an idea of how many there are in their complexity and variety. Barbara Hoffland in Soane's 1835 description describes the glass in the skylights in every instance in relation to the casts and marbles below. For example, um, a skylight is, quote, that soft primrose hue so peculiarly adapted for the exhibition of marbles, imparting the tint of time to those which have not attained it, yet not increasing its effects on the more ancient. In another area, she says the light pours, quote, its brightest beams on those objects most calculated to benefit by its presence. Under the main dome of the museum stands Soane's cast of the Apollo Belvedere. Um, its beauty, as Mrs. Hoffland says, quote, enhanced by that exquisite distribution of light and color, which often from undiscovered sources sheds the most exquisite hues and produces the most magical effects, communicating the only charm in which an assemblage of marbles must be deficient. Light and color are so intimately joined that we cannot separate them without losing one. Even the most breathing sculptures require some aid from those ethereal tints, which at the same moment rescue them from the characteristics of death and reveal those of life, beauty, and intelligence." End quote. It's interesting that you can see in this slide the intensity of the effect of the sunlight. Um, Apollo stands in the sun, created by the amber glass in the skylight behind that sculpture. And that effect, I'm happy to say, has been recovered in the last few years by the blocking up of a big opening in the wall behind. I, I wouldn't have believed the, the difference that, um, that that could make in terms of intensifying the, the light effect. I'm going to read a bit more from Mrs. Hoffland. It sounds a bit wordy, but I promise it, it won't be like this for the rest of the talk. But I think what she says is really interesting. And she continues on the museum. Colors are the smiles of nature. Nature is manifestly very fond of color for she has made nothing without it. Her skies are blue, her fields green, her waters vary with her skies. This conception of the value of color, as expressed by Mr. Lee Hunt and Marlowe, our fine old poet, undoubtedly influenced Sir John Soane when he introduced colored light into this part of his mansion. He has thus brought painting, so far as painting is color, to embellish architecture and sculpture. The tenderest hues of the primrose, deepening into golden yellow, brilliant crimson, scarlet, emerald green, and splendid purple, shed their richest tints to give tone and luster to the works of art. Of course, these exquisite effects vary with the time and the atmosphere, but the colored glass is so judiciously disposed, assisted by innumerable reflections from mirrors, that the coldness likely to arise from objects nearly devoid of color is completely avoided and a diffusion of warm and cheerful light cast upon everything we behold. She goes on that the pleasurable sensations produced are 
particularly valuable in this country, since the collector, however he might succeed in obtaining Roman antiquities, cannot add the pure ether and the glowing skies of those more favoured climes. It's, it's really fascinating to see from this long passage how Barbara Hoffland relates Soane's museum to a landscape, highlights his painterly use of colour and emphasises that the coloured glass is creating the effect of being underneath a Mediterranean sky um, and in the Italian sun. Professor David Watkin in his book on Soane's lectures um, points out that Soane shared his obsession with colour and light with the post-Newtonian poets like James Thompson, who published The Seasons in 1730. To Thompson, um, as to Newton, the golden light of yellow was the most luminous and beautiful of them all. This is not just the light with which Soane bathed his museum. He used it in interiors such as his mausoleum at Dulwich Picture Gallery, in the Royal Gallery at Westminster, and in many other projects. Soane believed that poetry was akin to architecture and that poetry could be created by using light. In describing the breakfast parlour in the museum with its pale yellow glass, um, skylights and central lantern light containing panels of stained glass and its dome grained in light oak studded with small convex mirrors, Soane points out that his combination of variety of outline spatial intricacy and coloured light produces, quote, a sequence of those fanciful effects that constitute the poetry of architecture. That Mrs. Hoffland mentions the painterly qualities of this coloured light is no surprise. The first guide to the museum was after all called the Union of Architecture, Sculpture and Painting. Soane shared his interest in light and especially the effects of yellow light with his friend and fellow Royal Academy professor, J.M.W. Turner. Mrs. Soane bought this watercolor, Turner's Kirkstall Abbey, with another work from Turner's gallery in 1804. With its low vaulted space lit by shafts of light, the effect intensified by reflections in the water and vistas beyond the ruins, the picture must have had just the right picturesque elements for her husband evoking poetry in architecture. Soane's own architectural eloquence is captured in the visions of Joseph Michael Gandhi, who worked for him for more than 30 years as a perspective artist, preparing the watercolours that represented Soane's schemes at the Royal Academy's summer exhibitions. In this watercolour, he drew Soane's Bank of England just completed as if it were a romantic future ruin bathed in golden light. In addition to using a uh, coloured glass in the skylights over his museum, Soane incorporated it into a bookcase door filled with small subject panels and this glazed screen at the top of the stairs down to the basement. Uh, there are no views of this screen in situ surviving, but it was a really interesting feature. And in this slide, you see on the left, the record drawing of it, which was made by Soane's glazier, William Watson, in 1837, just after Soane's death. And on the right, you see a detail of the architect's drawing for its reinstatement, which we hope will happen next year. And you'll see from that drawing that um, we have two missing panels in the lower part of the screen, which is a bit of a shame, but nonetheless, it will still be going back. As you can see, this screen had a large piece of yellow glass um, in the centre, you can see it well in, in the left-hand slide. Uh, and that was between four groups of subject panels above and below. Mrs. Hoffland refers to this screen as giving a view of a large and beautiful Etruscan vase through a window of coloured glass. And I put this in because that is such a painterly idea that uh, a sweep of colour should fall across an object in the way that a watercolorist might put a glaze across um, a scene. In the breakfast parlor, um, painterly effects are taken even further with the display of three plaster casts, um, Flaxman works covered with yellow glass as if they are painted yellow. And you can see them here set into the fireplace. 
Descending to the basement crypt of Soane's museum, the visitor encounters a different atmosphere. The light is filtered out, entering only through apertures in the ground floor above. It is, quote from Mrs. Hoffland again, subdued yet sufficient to evoke that sentiment proper to the visitants of the dead. And uh, that would be the dead whose ashes would have been housed in the cinerary urns you can see in the catacombs in the distance in the right hand image here. Mrs. Hoffland refers to, quote, the exclusion of light so desirable in a scene where we may exclaim with Milton, hail divinest melancholy, illustrating the importance that's sown attached to appropriate character created by the control of light. Adjacent to the basement crypt is the monk's parlor, the abode of Soane's imaginary hermit, Padre Giovanni, a play on his own name. Here, Soane covered the walls with casts from monuments in Westminster Abbey and Westminster Hall, placed illuminated manuscripts in the adjacent monk's cell and filled the window, two screens and a door with stained glass, as well as installing fragments from the Palace of Westminster to form the medieval ruins in the adjacent, in the adjacent yard. The monk's parlour is the ultimate romantic picturesque interior with a touch of the burlesque. And stained glass is a vital part of that effect. Soane describes the scriptural subjects represented on glass as being suited to the destination of the place, serving to quote, increase its somber character. Mrs. Hoffland describes the solitary monk viewing his carved crucifix, relics, and presses stored with drawings of ecclesiastical edifices, quote, through windows of painted glass, presenting subjects still more sacred. The richly tinted light descending to his apartment bestows on every object that mellow luster which aids the all-pervading sentiment. It is light subdued, not exhausted, an autumnal, not a wintry and waning ray and it becomes about midday perfectly splendid, being aided in effect by the brightness of the carpet and the chairs cushioned with crimson silk. Mrs. Hoffman was obviously one of the ladies who were regularly entertained to tea in this wonderful interior. The effect of the stained glass window is enhanced by the reflection of the glass in the mirror opposite, um, which you can see in this watercolor from 1830. As so often in Soane's description, there are no details given of the subjects or the age of the stained glass panels, um, just um, a passing piece of information that they came from monasteries and convents destroyed in the French Revolution. Soane seems only interested in their com contribution to the somber Gothic atmosphere of the parlor. The stained glass was installed when the parlor was built by William Watson, Soane's glazier and decorator. His bill for 1823 to 24 includes for glazing the window, but gives no details of where the glass was obtained or who supplied the colored borders, red, yellow, and blue, nor who painted the ball enrichments or the corner rosettes. The window relates to another directly above in an interconnecting space, the picture room recess. That window is filled with embossed white glass and contains a cross motif in ball enrichment within scroll borders. Doubtless the cross was a subtle symbolic link to the quasi-religious parlor below. Soane was obviously very proud of the monk's parlor window. Um, it's the only one of which he commissioned a detailed watercolor, which you see here, um, just a few months after the window was put in. That was just as well because it was uh, through the existence of this watercolor that we were able to find and identify every panel of glass in store and put the window back in place in the mid 1990s. The two doors into the monk's parlor also contain stained glass. The main door has a complex pattern of panels with the central one, which you see on the left here, appropriately showing a solitary hermit praying. The other door, which you see on the right, contains plain yellow glass with fret borders and this is uh, among the only original bits of glass uh, left in situ in the museum. Further panels of German glass 
are either side of the recess, which you can see just on the left in the right hand view, I'm just showing you a couple of details. After the museum, crypt and monk's parlour, Soane's 1835 description returns to the upper floors of the house and we ascend the main staircase. Uh, passing Flaxman's model of St. Michael on the left here, um, a, a subject from Milton's Paradise Lost, um, and St. Michael is lit from behind through yellow glass, if you look carefully, and we pass St. Michael to go up the stairs and reach the Shakespeare recess, which you see on the right, a small niche off the curve of the stairs. Symbolically, we ascend from the genius of Milton to the glory of Shakespeare. The Shakespeare recess is the second place in the house where Soane describes the subjects of stained glass in the window, um, the other being the library dining room, where, as we saw at the beginning, the antiquity of the two panels was obviously important to him. The main furnishings of the recess are two paintings by Henry Howard on the left-hand wall, the vision of Shakespeare, showing the bard contemplating visions of glory, that's the lower painting commissioned by Soane, and above it, Lear and Cordelia. At the far end on the cupboard is a cast of the bust of Shakespeare on the poet's memorial in Stratford. The two paintings face a stained glass window in which Soane describes 10 compartments of ancient painted, painted glass, among which are the Annunciation, the Prodigal Son, the Raising of Lazarus, the Last Supper, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Andrew and St. Matthias. There's no obvious reason for the choice of subjects for this window, and its very presence in the Shakespeare recess may seem a little odd until we read Mrs. Hoffland. She describes the recess as, quote, consecrated to Shakespeare's memory. And she continues, everything in this recess is in keeping with the sentiment inspired of honoring the memory and increasing the fame of Shakespeare. The paintings by Howard, the window of ancient glass, and the cherubs on the ceiling make it a shrine worthy of him whose glorious name it bears. The use of the word shrine is interesting. This tiny space is really like a side chapel in a cathedral with the frame of the large Howard painting going right down to the floor with a large inscription designed to turn that picture into something rather like an altarpiece. Um, the frame is not even gilt, but painted stone color something that emerged during its restoration. The stained glass window has now been reinstated as you see it here on the right, based on the engraving and on the diagram of its arrangement made in 1837, which you can see on the left. In the drawing rooms on the first floor, Soane used stained and colored glass um, to rather different effect. The glass um, on the first floor was probably not installed until the 1830s, and it's much richer in its colouring, with purple and red being dominant. And it's combined with bright yellow walls, um, as you see in this slide, um, Turner's patent yellow, restored in 1987. When Soane first built his house at 13 Lincoln's Inn Fields, its projecting white Portland stone frontage was an open balcony, and you can see that on the left here, um, in a watercolour from 1831. Um, it's interesting to note um, from this that Soane installed the stained and coloured glass in the east and west returns of the loggia on the first floor before it was glazed and became part of the interior of the house. You can just get a glimpse of the glass in the watercolour on the left. The loggia was glazed in and incorporated into the south drawing room in 1834. Mrs Hoffland um, refers to the novelty of the enclosed loggia, which makes the drawing room look larger and gives it an elegant individuality of character. She Ooh. describes the windows at each end of the loggia as containing specimens of ancient painted glass. That's a word that isn't used anywhere else in the description. It's interesting because the glass used here was unusual in being a set of eight panels deliberately shown together and therefore much more uniform in effect than elsewhere. The loggia is almost treated as a gallery with the glass on display. There are no special associations evoked here, although it does provide picturesque interest and variety. It, it serves specially to emphasize the effects of the sun. 
And this is perhaps why it's used um, here in the ends of the loggia rather than in the large south facing windows. The Penny Magazine in 1837, um, an article written just after Soane's death, described the drawing room as, quote, lit up with gorgeous hues, end quote, as a result of these windows. Ascending further up the staircase beyond the drawing rooms, visitors come to the Tivoli recess, like the Shakespeare recess, a tiny space on the curve of the stair. Here, Soane installed between 1832 and 34, a large painted window by the glassmaker William Collins of the Strand, which was a copy of a celebrated window painted by Thomas Gervais of Charity, um, based on a design by Sir Joshua Reynolds, which still survives in the chapel at New College, Oxford. So notes that the window of painted glass, quote, throws an agreeable tint on the surrounding objects, and his text emphasizes how celebrated the Reynolds window in New College was. Mrs. Hoffland doesn't mention the window, um, but she does go into great detail about the sculpture in this recess, saying that the works of Thomas Banks, John Flaxman and Francis Chantry have combined to, quote, render this a delightful spot, making us feel proud of their names and flattered that they are our countrymen. Soane's intention in introducing the charity window was probably to evoke pride in Reynolds' achievement and link his name with those of the, of the illustrious sculptors whose works were in this tiny space. This next slide illustrates what I think has been the triumphant restoration of the Tivoli window, lost all but two small pieces in World War II by the glassmaker Jonathan Cook. And on the left here is his extraordinary pencil cartoon, and on the right, the finished window. Um, and here, details of um, the newly painted glass border on the left, and on the right, the lower part of the window, uh, which incorporates the one surviving panel, the central scroll from the original window, salvaged after the wartime bombing. On the upper part of the staircase and the second floor of the house, Soane had a number of windows, some internal and a number of doors, all containing stained glass panels similar to those elsewhere. The internal windows on the staircase, seen here in a watercolour of 1825, incorporated red borders, perhaps to create a darker magical feeling for the staircase and a more intimate feeling for the little oratory beyond which they lit. The diagrams on the right are from the 1837 inventory and show how these windows were arranged at the time of Soane's death. And here they are restored um, in situ following their restoration in recent years. The oratory itself, which is beyond these two internal windows, has um, a very fine window of its own, now also restored, containing a panel depicting a solitary hermit, Saint Arsenius, which you can see on the right. I've put in the 1837 sketch and these two views of the restored window. What is so lovely about this little oratory, which started life as a loo, um, is that by the end of Soane's life, it was sort of a shrine. It's almost as if Soane, in the guise of the solitary hermit of the monk's parlor, is here in the window. And in front of it is this little urn, which looks very much like a cinerary urn that might contain the ashes of the dead, but it's an urn decorated by um, Eliza Soane, his beloved wife, um, who died many years before. Soane's tiny bathroom also had a fine window, and I'm just putting this in so that you see that that too um, has been recreated, incorporating a fine surviving panel, um, a 17th century stained glass. Um, in the model room too, there is stained glass in the window overlooking the fields. Um, and it's interesting that we know that um, Soane commissioned yellow glass covers for some of the models, but unfortunately we don't know which ones, but it, the idea that he used colored glass in covers over the models provides a parallel to John Britton's Celtic cabinet in Devizes Museum, which you see on the left here, which has a model of Stonehenge in ruins under a cover containing yellow, orange and dark red glass on different sides. For the sake of completeness, I'm showing you um, 
other things. Um, first on the right of this slide, a mirror with amber and mirror glass that is in the model room that illuminates and reflects the back of two very fine plaster models by Fouquet. And here, Soane's bedroom door and double doors across the book passage. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of glass on the second floor. Mrs. Hofflin comments that the whole of this floor, the private apartments, demonstrates Soane's, quote, extraordinary power of contrivance in obtaining space, as it were, out of nothing. She describes the rooms as the very acme of convenience, elegance and comfort. Um, with their old china, beautiful stained and painted glass, um, paintings, sculptures and prints. And she describes them as the proper retreat of one who has long devoted himself to the fine arts. Again, the stained glass is present to, to contribute character and is not described in detail. The last window that's mentioned in Soane's description is the one at the top of the staircase. Um, and here you see the diagram of it from 1837 and on the right the window as recreated with as many of the panels um, as survive um, in it. You'll note that the red of the diagram looks a lot paler than the red in the window but the red in the window is absolutely precisely correct and again a little story when I was first at the museum this window um, didn't have any glass in it and um, it had to be taken out in order for the sash to be repaired. When it was taken out, the pockets, the sash pockets, were full of soot, I mean, to a depth of about five inches. And in the soot were tiny little shards of red glass. And I salvaged those shards and got very sooty in the process and stored them in tiny little Kodak film containers in a drawer. And when we came to be able to put this window back, I was able to take out shards of the original red glass, presumably blown out in the wall, and hand them to the restorers so they could get the colour precisely right. Now, Soane writes a really uh, Mrs. Hofflin, sorry, describes this window in a great deal of detail. She says it's beautifully painted, and she goes on: the medallions in each pane are, are delicately drawn subjects of scripture history but the color of the rest is a deep red, which makes every object seen through it appear as if there was a conflagration in the immediate neighborhood. One might almost warm himself amid December's snow by barely looking on this summer heat. That is just the most extraordinarily theatrical description. And it, it's led me to ponder the impact that the theater and popular entertainments may have had on Soane's use of stained and coloured glass. By the 1770s, um, the use of backlit transparencies was common in the theatre. Um, and um, as early as 1759, Garrick had used transparencies in one of his productions with scarlet, crimson and bright blue screens lit from behind to bathe his sets in a succession of rich colours. In the late 18th century, transparencies were also being used in the pleasure gardens, to which Soane was a frequent visitor, and at public celebrations. As architect of the Bank of England, one of Soane's earliest tasks was to design illuminations to celebrate the recovery of George III from madness in 1789. And this is an engraving of the Threadneedle Street facade of the bank, whose architect Soane was, uh, decorated with yellow lamps, garlands, medallions and stars for this celebration. And Soane hung this engraving in his North drawing room. He would also have been very familiar with the designs of the artist Philip de Lutherberg, um, a fellow Royal Academician for theatrical scenery at Drury Lane, where Soane was often in the audience. De Lutherberg constantly experimented with lighting, and made use of transparencies, reflectors, coloured slides, or silk screens lit from behind. Soan also made use of similar effects. Here are two nighttime views of the dome area in 1811. Um, and here again, uh, a Gandhi painting of Soan designs, um, dramatically lit um, with some sort of reflector with a lamp um, behind it. De Lutherberg knew that having movable elements was key to creating effects um, in the theatre that no painter could produce in the confines of a frame. Soane knew this too, 
and the museum incorporates movable planes for the display of paintings and sewn stained glass doors could be regarded as screens used to create a variety of effects. De Lutherberg's Ida Fusicon was one of the most popular entertainments ever seen in London. Um, on the left is the only surviving view. It's rather tame, I'm afraid. Um, it was a box and scenes were produced within the box, um, such as Aurora, um, with the effects of dawn over a view of London. Lutherberg used cloths, cutouts, um, semi-transparent colours on strips of linen stretched on frames. And he had a battery of lamps with stained glass in different colours in front of them, changed as necessary. The European magazine described it as a new species of painting. I've put in de Lutherberg's painting of the Battle of the Nile to give an idea of the kind of effects he was aiming at. The Ida Fusicon opened um, the year after Sohn got back from his grand tour and closed again the following year in 1782. It opened various times later. Uh, its final demise came in 1800 when it burnt down shortly after the introduction of, quote, a Mount Etna scene. Um, so I think we can all imagine what went wrong there. Um, but what's fascinating about its last incarnation is that Soane's later amanuensis, John Britton, appeared on the bill aged 28, performing recitations and songs. The Ida Fusicon became a bit of a legend it inspired other, other artists, Gainsborough, for example, with his show box, with transparencies used, to, um, used with candles behind to project scenes to help him design paintings. And it also inspired John Martin's apocalyptic paintings. It's interesting that amongst the Ida Fusicon scenes at one point was Satan arraying his troops on the banks of the fiery lake with the raising of pandemonium after Milton. This was apparently quite spectacular and contemporaries ransacked their vocabularies of the sublime to convey the awful effect. One spoke of the architecture, quote, seemingly composed of unconsuming and unquenchable fire. As the fires rose, an intense red gave way to a transparent white. Intense red? I wonder if this Ida Fusicon description and episode could possibly have influenced Mrs. Hoffland's description of Soane's red staircase glass as evoking unquenchable fires. Well, we've concluded our tour. If you'd visited the Soane 30 years ago, you would have seen almost no colored glass in the museum, just a few pieces of yellow and amber in two skylights and two doors, and that one intact door in the monk's parlor. The only stained glass panels in the entire museum at that time were two in the monk's parlor. To my mind, it's been one of the crowning achievements of the last 30 years of restoration to bring back all the glass and get it almost all back in situ, just two screens to go. Um, thank goodness Soane's Glazier made those meticulous diagrams in 1837. And God bless Arthur Bolton, the curator who took all the subject panels of glass out in 1918, put it into store, and by doing so ensured that it survived the Second World War. I could not have believed when I opened that straw filled packing case 30 years ago that we would end up in 2015, having put back pretty well all Soane's arrangements of coloured and stained glass, which seemed at the time irretrievably lost. Soane's old friend Isaac Disraeli wrote to, to thank him for a copy of the 1835 description. And he said, your museum is permanently magical. Some in poems have raised fine architectural edifices, but most rare have been those who've discovered when they finished their house, if such a house can ever be said to be finished, that they had built a poem. I hope I've shown you this afternoon the part that Glass played in creating that built poem. And I hope that our work in putting it all back in the last three decades has contributed to bring some of the magic back to Soane's permanently magical museum. Thank you. Helen, that was so wonderful. Um, I just want to say that this um, year, 
our uh, lecture series has taken us all over the world and has did many different interests in the way that John Zone had so many different interests that influenced him. But it is so good, I feel, to come home. I feel like we've come home tonight back to Sir John's wonderful museum and how great to be greeted by you and to give us a tour of the glass, but the glass is, is so much everywhere that you've given us a tour almost of the whole museum, which is really wonderful. And I have to say that there is so much depth to this building and so much richness and so many layers that no matter how many times I visit it or read the books about it or come back, when you speak about it or um, when Bruce Boucher speaks about it, you know it so well that I learn another book's worth of information. This is just fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Paul. That's very generous. All I can say is that even after 30 years, it's such an amazing building that I see something new every time I go into a room and pause and look at something. It's quite astonishing. We're gonna go into some question and answers, but I just wanna say that it's, I also loved hearing that this process of glass restoration started 30 years ago because in 2022, 2022 will be the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Sohn Foundation. Mm -hmm. so, and that was, I've just been around here a few years, but the wonderful people who founded the Sohn Foundation 30 years ago, many of whom are still around uh, and, and involved, uh, I'm so glad to see that we were, uh, you know, at least in some small part, a part of uh, the funding of this wonderful restoration. You certainly were. And, you know, Susie McGee and Cindy Spurdle were there right at the beginning, um, coming over and seeing that new glass in the skylights. Wonderful, wonderful. So th those of you listening to us, by the way, um, of course, the reason we're here is, we're gonna to get to your questions, by the way, but the reason we're here is to raise money for, the, for, the, for this, this wonderful museum. And uh, you can, um, Michael will tell you how you can donate. But also think of us uh, as we, you know, in the in the fall when we're gonna we're, we'll do our gala and our um, our honors evening, and uh, think of us at that time, and you can uh, help us to uh, to maintain and to to make sure that this glass may, uh, keeps being restored because it's fascinating that the process is still going on, and you can imagine that such a complex building requires a lot of work for its maintenance, and. Um, Thank you, Helen. So Michael, do you want to take us some of the, through some of the, the Q&A? Sure, and, and I invite Helen, of course, to read through and, and pick out any that feel uh, particularly uh, in need of answering. But I think that for those who haven't been to the museum whom we want to give a full sense of the impact of the colored and stained glass, the question about the quality of light is important. So Helen, someone asks, how the quality of light changes today. You just, you gave us some historical descriptions, but what's your experience of the way the light changes? Um, and if so, did Sohn prefer any time of year, time of day for optimal lighting effect? We know he liked for it to be sunny outside. Definitely. And you know, the not, not welcoming visitors in wet or dirty weather, I think was partly obvious. You don't want water and dirt trampled brought into your home but it was also about light and he had in his old age you know in his 80s in the last few years he had quite um well developed system for people to come and visit the museum not just people um he knew but anybody could apply to come um i think the way that he set the museum up shows how he wanted it to be viewed you know it was to be open only for six months of the year and pretty much in the lightest months. It was not intended in, in his original bequest that it be open all year round as it is now. Um, and of course, he would have had to bring out lamps and candles, you know, as soon as it got dark. Um, and indeed only had a couple of gas lamps, one in a central courtyard and one at the front door. Um, so it, it is quite dark. It, the light varies a huge amount. And when the sun comes out, you know, those who know the museum know that it is just glorious. It's wonderful on a dull day as well, 
but the effects are much more muted and they definitely vary with time of day and time of year. You know, the height of the sun in the sky, its angle and so on is really important. I think one of the things that really saddens me is that we can actually never see it as Sohn saw it because the museum is surrounded by such tall buildings that even though we think of it as having fantastic natural light and being all being so beautiful, actually it is compromised to some extent by those surrounding structures, especially I think the effects that would have come with the rising and the setting of the sun, which I think might have been quite intentional. Hey, Helen, one thing about, it's great hearing you talk about how Sohn would have lit candles and uh, that, if, I'm wondering if Sohn ever wrote about the effects that he saw when the museum was lighted by in the evening by candles and lanterns. Not specifically. We just have his, his accounts of his um, admiration for Lumiere Mysterieuse. Right. And we have those two glorious views of the dome area lit at night, which give you a very good idea of the sort of effect that he might have tried to create, which is very dramatic. And we then just have uh, the records of the extraordinary three evening celebrations that he held when he acquired his Egyptian sarcophagus. And he lit the museum very carefully and um, everything was, was orchestrated so that the the sarcophagus itself would be in darkness pretty much at the back of the museum, but the library dining room at the front of the house where people were going to have their coffee and cake would be tremendously highly illuminated. So obviously all intended to play on your emotions. I would love to see those drawings. I don't think I've ever seen them. Fantastic. Helen, there's a, there's a question here that has been addressed in your talk, but I think it would be good to return to it to make it very clear. Georgia asks, is the yellow glass a way of having the warmth of the wonderful light of Italy in the museum? And it Absolutely, may definitely. His experience of the grand tour to and the Mediterranean sun to that question. Yeah, I think absolutely, definitely. I mean, Sohn himself does not explicitly say that, but Barbara Hoffland does. And um, there's no doubt, even if you look in, in Sohn's diary entries, she visited the museum and went round it with him on many occasions. And the reason he includes her text about it is presumably because he rather likes her feminine purple prose, but doesn't feel it's quite appropriate for him to write in that style, perhaps. Um, and somehow we get the best, best of both his sort of formal architectural text and her, her gushings. So well, yes, definitely. And I think the way the light comes from above, particularly in the dome area, which everyone can see beautifully behind you, Michael, because it is your background and you can see the way that there aren't any windows. So the light really is mimicking the sun coming down as it were, almost into a, an interior ruin scape. Thank you, that is a perfect answer. And now, to sort of close out, one that's related to conservation and materials, and then a, a more open-ended question for you, Helen. Okay. The first about conservation. Edwin asks, what kind of paint is used on the glass, and is there a qualitative difference between light through painted color and through color in the glass itself? I think there is a, there is a, a, a qualitative difference. Um, the plain coloured glass in the museum is all, you know, the colour is in the glass itself. Um, and that is, is very subtle and beautiful. It's quite difficult to do. It's difficult to get the colours right. Fortunately, we have got, we have pretty much got an original piece of everything, including pale and dark yellow, but we haven't got much of anything, but we've got a bit to copy of everything. Then obviously the subject panels are made in the way that medieval panels or 16th or 17th century panels were made, and that varies. And then we have the Georgian painted glass and etched glass, which is effectively what you've seen in the borders. That's the glass that Sohn bought and then framed his, his historical panels with. And that is uh, often, as with the charity window, painted in enamels on the surface of the glass. So it's much denser and you get a much um, richer sort of colour. But 
What is fascinating and uh, is that when we did the recreation of the charity window, which you saw, and Jonathan did a fantastic job and you saw the lower panel with the central bit, which survived from the original window. If you get up close to that panel and you look at it, you will see uh, something which Jonathan said to me at the time. He said, I can't absolutely get 100% the intensity that they achieved. And he said that is because it's almost certainly because they used chemicals which are banned now. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for, for many years when I was first at the same, we used to get glass from Poland because they could use chemicals that weren't allowed in the UK. <laughs> uh, and now they can't use them either. So we're really stuck. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, it's becoming, it was become very difficult. And Jonathan spent, I should think, a year researching how to, how to try to paint that enameled window because Georgian glass painting is, is so complicated and their techniques are so hard to pin down and they use such a variety of different um, oils and solvents when they were applying their color. And he's done a beautiful job, but there is an intensity to original glass from that period that is almost impossible to get. You know, we get 99.9% .9 there Fascinating, fascinating. If anyone is really interested in the glass, if you go to our website and you go to the conservation pages and to conservation techniques, um, you will find um, a couple of short films extracted from longer films about our restoration, which deal with the glass painting and the recreation of glass. And I'll pop those links into the chat box and leave this session open for of minutes after we close so that you can Barbara Hoffland's uh, prose. There's a great deal of laudatory prose here for you. I, I'm reading the oh. most beautiful messages thanking you for tonight and also acknowledging that that 30 year period of returning the museum to its authentic appearance overlaps with your tenure. I mean, there can be no mistaking your instrumental role in returning this colored and stained glass to us so that we can see it with these uh, fresh eyes. And Lauren begins her comment that with the statement, what an incredible legacy you have as a curator. What are the lingering research questions or mysteries that continue to pop up for you? And we're all ears because we're very- oh. <laughs> Well, I've just, I've just been writing a chapter on Soane's architectural models and investigating a, 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 a strange interlude when Soane turned his two drawing rooms into a kind of architectural gallery just for a couple of years. No views, no nothing, but you can deduce it all from the bills. So I'm always doing all kinds of bits of research. Just at the moment, I'm looking into the question of what Soane really thought about traveling to Greece. Um, he always claimed that he hadn't been able to go to Greece because um, it was all terribly unfortunate and his fellow travellers didn't want to go, but he did. And then I found an account written by John Britton saying that that was totally untrue and it was actually Soane who'd voted against going to Greece. So I'm looking into that at the moment. So there are always new things to do, but it's really been an extraordinary privilege to have a career that's overlapped with that restoration and really... I owe my career to Peter Thornton, who was a great pioneer of authentic restoration. Mm. And he joined the zone the year before I did with that specific remit to restore those interiors. And he was generous enough to let me take it further. And I remember quite vividly, he was talking about paint and glass. And I, I was doing some work on the inventory and I went into him and said, you know, Peter, you're, you're, you're doing the colours, but I think if we if we looked at those views and we looked at the inventory sequences, we could work out where all the objects should be. And I remember it vividly because he looked up from his desk, gave me a huge smile. He said, fine, you do it. <laughs> and I, I count that as a sort of moment when my Sonian life began, if you like. It makes me feel quite overwhelmed just to think about it because... He was so generous, you know, he let me run at the age of 22, 23, you know, he was prepared to hand me the architect's specifications and say, you go through them, you compare them with the research, you make comments, you question what they're saying they want to do. And he let me do all that. 
which was just just so incredibly generous and I I learned so much and I owe so much and I've got to say this to our fantastic architectural team at Julian Harrop Architects who have been with us for the whole of those 30 years both Julian himself and and now Lyle Thau who's been working at the museum since 2003 who's my not just a, a now a, a very very close friend but my my partner in crime when it comes to getting the Sony Museum perfected. And, um, you know, we're gearing up at the moment for the restoration of Sony's office. And yes. that is another current research project. Um, we're trying to find out as much as we can about how Sony ran his practice, everything from how did he get materials to building sites all over the country? And, you know, what was involved in Sony himself traveling around to see clients in, Cornwall or East Anglia or up in the northeast of England. It was a busy life and, and an amazing professional career alongside the creation of the museum. And our uh, generous supporters helped fund the first phase of that drawing office project, which we'll be telling them more about soon as it enters. Yeah, it certainly has. And, and that is, is, is really absolutely fantastic. And, and we, we can't thank you enough for your support because this is a really it's a kind of cornerstone thing in a way. I mean, the, the restoration of Soane's private apartments um, brought back Soane's private life, if you like, and Mrs. Soane into the heart of the museum. Now we have to make sure that Soane's professional life and his architectural career is also, you know, right there at the heart of things and restoring the office, even though it's tiny and hardly anyone can get into it physically, is going to be absolutely fantastic. And we're going to make sure that as many people as possible can enjoy it and also learn about how architecture worked in that period. Mm -hmm. It is one of the great architectural spaces anywhere. It's, it's really, it's so imaginative. Um, Helen, I wish that, you know what I wish? I wish that we were all together in the same room so that we could go out and have dinner and talk to you about all these brilliant ideas that you brought up and all these concepts that you brought up. Somebody raised a question, will this be available to me afterwards? And yes, indeed, because Helen, you have uh, essentially provided a book for us this evening and for everybody all over the world. And so Michael is going to be posting this and it will be available on our website. Uh, I I'd like to talk about our next lecture, but Michael, is there anything else we wanna hit on first? I, th I think we don't want to keep Helen any longer because she's um, a couple hours ahead of us and she needs to get some rest. <laughs> I think we can, knowing, knowing that we will hear more from her in the future, we can pause for now. Well, Thank please you. do pass my email address around and, and anybody please do get in touch if there are any other questions or burning things you'd like to ask. We certainly shall. And we'll also everyone share your questions with Helen we have an upcoming newsletter that contains the extended Q&As from our last two lectures. And Helen, if there are any questions that you'd like to address, um, we'll certainly make sure you have them and we'll share those <coughs> in the upcoming newsletter. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Helen. So uh, I, I was fascinated by how important uh, 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 Sohn's friend Mrs. Hoffman was with all of her descriptions. And one of the things she said was that colors are the smiles of nature. And that is a perfect pivot to our next lecture, uh, which is going to be by Janice Parker in two weeks on April 8th. And she's going to be speaking about garden rooms and the landscape, and in particular, how color, starting with landscape architects like Gertrude Jekyll, was used to create different feelings and sensations in outdoor gardens. So please join us in two weeks on April on, on April 8th for what will be another fascinating evening and for spring we'll be taking you out into the garden. Thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you then. <laughs>